Happy holidays, everyone, and welcome to this special edition of Truth and Reconciliation. And this special program is in memory of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who passed away on uh, December 20, 26th, I believe. And I have special guests to really talk about the legacy of uh, Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. So my name is Bukola Shonoga, and I am the host of the podcast, Truth and Reconciliation. So I'm gonna start with the introduction. So Archbishop Tutu was a global citizen with great compassion for humanity. He possessed a moral compass and moral authority to inspire a better outcome for South Africa and the world. And he has left us the blueprint for peace. I'll give you a little background on Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He was born in 1931 in Klokdo, Transvaal. He trained as a teacher at Pretoria Bantun Normal College and graduated from the University of South Africa in 1954. He later studied theology and was ordained as a priest in 1960. He taught theology in South Africa from 1967 to 1972, and he was assistant director of theology, Theological Institute in London. In, 1950, in 1975, he was appointed dean of St. Mary's Cathedral in, jo in Johannesburg, the first black to hold that position. He was bishop of Lesotho from 1976 to 1978. And in 1978 also, he became the first black General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches. Tutu is an honorary doctor of a number of leading universities in the USA, in Britain, and in Germany. Archbishop Tutu formulated his subjective as a democratic and just society without racial divisions and set forth the following points as minimum demands. Equal civil rights for all, the abolition of South Africa's passport laws, a common system of education, decision of forced deportation from South Africa to the so-called homelands. So these were the hallmarks of Archbishop Desmond Tutu's uh, objective. So I have Honorable Popo Molefe, who was joining me from South Africa today. I really appreciate you sir, taking time in a short you know, time to, to join this conversation. Honorable Popo Simon Molefe is a South African politician, chairman of both of directors of state owned companies and was the first ever premier of the Northwest province. Molefe was one of the founding members of the Azania People's Organization at its formation in 1978 and became the first chairman of the Soweto branch in 1979. He was co-founder of the United Democratic Front, UDF in January, 1983, and became the national secretary also in August, 1983. Mr. Malefe was arrested on several occasions as a result of his political activities. Following his release from prison in 1989 for anti-apartheid activities, Malefe became a member of the newly legalized African National Congress. His business accomplishments include, he was the founder and exec, executive chairman of Larocco Investments Limited, chairman of the Armaments Corporation of South Africa, a state defense material procurement company, chairman of the state owned Petroleum and Gas Corporation of South Africa, Petrosa, co-executive chairman of Anorak Resources Corporation, a platinum mining and exploration company, and was also the chancellor of Northwest University in 2004. He was also the chairman of Transnet, it was the board of directors, actually chairman of the board of directors of Transnet uh, from 2008, 2018 till present. And forgive me, sir, if I make any mistake here, you can correct me when you, when you get to speak. And also he was awarded, was conferred by President of South Africa with the Chief Albert Luthuli Award in silver, the highest award in recognition of his years of contribution to the liberation of South Africa. He was also conferred by the University of the Northwest an honorary doctorate in philosophy for life contribution, for his life contribution to the struggle for life struggle for liberation and service to the people of South Africa. Thank you, sir, for joining. So I also have Shelton Jefferson. 
Mr. Jefferson brings nearly 20 years of investment banking and advisory experience structuring transactions for municipal and corporate clients. He served as counsel to the legal and le regulatory arm of the New York State Legislators Corporations, Authorities and Commissions Committee. In that capacity, Mr. Jefferson reviewed, developed, and wrote law to manage the structure and is issuance of nearly $15 billion of debt per year through New York, through New York's para status. Mr. Jefferson also has several years of successful financial advisory and deal structuring experience on the African continent. He is currently semi-retired and lives in Johannesburg, South Africa. Mr. Jefferson holds a Juris Doctorate from Ofstra University School of Law, an MA in International Economics, an MA in Political Science from Long Island University, and a BA from Lincoln University. I have also a, an old friend, a journalist, a veteran journalist, Gloria Wilson. Gloria and I go way back. So on that note, I'm going to open the floor. First, I'm going to go to Honorable Popo Molefe, and if I pronounce your name correctly, please correct me. Thank you so much sir, for joining us in this, you know, uh, uh, critical moment in, in, in history. The passing of um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, you know, it's a global, it's a global affair. And, I, and I, I feel that we are celebrating him today. We're not, when some people die, we mourn them. Uh, maybe in a sad way, but the, 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 the We've been gathering from the international community. The feedback is that this is a celebration of Archbishop Tutu's life, what he has contributed to the global community, and how he has inspired us to be better world citizens. Welcome, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Bukala. Um, <clears throat> just to add uh, on the profile you have given, uh, I think one of the most uh, important moments in my life was the fact that uh, as we were preparing to for the election of 1994, uh, I was requested by the National Executive Committee of the ANC and Nelson Mandela in particular to become the chairperson of the National Electoral Commission of the ANC and therefore to lead the campaign, which if successful, would see Nelson Mandela become the president of uh, the Republic of South Africa. And it is worth mentioning that as we were not experienced in governance and running elections, we had to uh, scour the world and uh, bring experts in elections to South Africa. Amongst those that we brought was, uh, um, the, uh, the expert who was teaching uh, Frank Greer from the United States and uh, um, Stanley, I forget his uh, name now, but also we learned from the Harvard University on how to deal with conflict at that time, uh, assisted by Professor Roger Fisher, uh, who was heading the Harvard School of Law. Uh, at the time. Uh, so that moment, of course, of appointment resulted in a resounding victory for the ANC, and the ANC for the first time established a government in the country. But given that the country had been divided extensively, we needed to establish a government of national unity in order to ensure that both black and white, uh, the opponents, uh, in the uh, struggle for freedom and those who were seeking to retain the obnoxious uh, system of apartheid could work together to refashion a new South Africa. Now, <clears throat> as a young man uh, in my days of struggle, I, I was fortunate to come across uh, the Archbishop Tutu and uh, who inspired many of I must say that whilst we celebrate him as a phenomenal man and a global icon, uh, we equally recognize the fact that uh, his passing on has meant that 
the hand of tragedy had grabbed uh, the nation in South Africa, particularly at a time when the country is facing enormous challenges of uh, restoration of the moral fiber of our society. Uh, we needed more of the advice, the courage, the outspokenness of uh, the Archbishop Tutu in the current period. Um, but if we were to talk about Archbishop Tutu, we probably need to locate his role within the context of the body politics of South Africa. Archbishop Desmond Tutu rose at a time when the, the system of apartheid had become at all time vicious. Uh, they had crushed the organizations of the people. The Pan-Africanist Congress, ANC, the South African Communist Party had been bent. And in 1977, our organizations, which I was part of, the Black Consciousness Movement, South African Student Organization, the Black People's Convention, and uh, I think about several uh, publications, newspapers, which were very outspoken, including the, the world newspaper were banned. Uh, Steve Bigo was also banned, that time, but of course he had just died actually, was banned and died in September of 1977. That meant that there was a period of lull and the Archbishop therefore emerged as the torchbearer of hope for millions of South Africans who were oppressed, who were denied fundamental rights to participate in the government, the government of their own country. He carried that torch and inspired millions of South Africans, demonstrating uh, amazing courage and uh, forthrightness against the, 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 the obnoxious system of apartheid, the, the brutal government of John Foster and P.W. Border, and later on, that of President Frederick de Klerk. So in a sense, he played the role of uniting uh, South Africans. But his com compassion itself gave hope to millions of families whose next of key were in the dungeons of prison on Robben Island and various parts of our country. And those who were holed up in the camps in the bushes of Angola, in Zambia, uh, in Mozambique. And he kept the promise alive that our freedom was possible and our freedom was not that far. It was going to happen in due course. So, so in a sense, therefore, he, he, he was a very important man in the, the annals of uh, the struggle for freedom. The world and all of us know the Archbishop as a fearless man. A man who would say, uh, if God is on the side of justice, uh, justice that defined the struggle for freedom of the people of South Africa, which included a range of uh, dimensions, uh, including international isolation of South Africa, in which many uh, people in the United States and the world over were participated to isolate South Africa, to promote economic sanctions against South Africa, to force the apartheid government to, to its knees by 1985, when the then president, P.W. Borda, was giving uh, his historic Rubicon speech, uh, which after giving, he never was able to cross that Rubicon, but drowned in it. So the Archbishop played a very uh, crucial role. Uh, and his activities, as you all know, uh, campaigning for the release of Mandela, the return of the exile, and campaigning for peace and reconciliation resulted 
in him conferred the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in 1985, 1985. At that time, the viciousness of the apartheid government had intensified. Uh, the, the regime with its allies in right-wing countries of the West sought to isolate the Archbishop, uh, isolate Dr. Alan Busak, both of whom, whom at the time were the patrons of the United Democratic Front. The UDF rallied the people of South Africa in defense of Archbishop Tutu. And we organized a big celebration in Soweto uh, in appreciation of the Nobel Peace Prize conferred on the bishop, but also to say to the apartheid government, if you touch the archbishop, you are touching millions of the black people of South Africa. We also wanted them never to touch uh, Dr. Alan Busak. We said the hands of Alan Busak. We chose that moment also as a critical moment for Nelson Mandela to release his a statement from prison in response to attempt by the then president of uh, the Republic of uh, South Africa, Peter uh, Verlam Buota, who was asking Nelson Mandela to agree to be released from jail, provided he would accept that he is not a citizen of South Africa, but a citizen of some compartment called uh, the trans guy, a so-called homeland for the Cossacks. And Nelson Mandela in his letter said that he was not going to agree to be released on those conditions. And that he regarded Oliver Tambo with whom he, has been, he had been in struggle for 50 years at the time as his brother and comrade. And that uh, in his view, there were no differences between him and the policies that the African National Congress uh, uh, espoused at the time. Uh, it is a message and the celebration of the Nobel Peace Prize that inspired greater confidence and uh, united South Africans behind Archbishop Tutu and behind the struggle for freedom, because all of us understood that that struggle was fundamentally the struggle for human rights. It was a struggle for justice and that the Archbishop symbolized uh, the righteousness and the justice that we pursued. Um, of course, you, you spoke about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission when finally we, oh, I must say, by the way, the Archbishop was so outspoken. When we established the first government and all of us got into office, and unlike many South Africans who were getting paltry salaries, we were now as politicians going to be paid huge salaries that we had never uh, imagined before. And the Archbishop said, you are now all getting onto the gravy train. You should not be accepting uh, such huge salaries. And Nelson Mandela in response to what the Bishop said, said we're all going to reduce the salaries that we are receiving, and we will not get any increase for the next year or two. Um, so it shows the moral authority that the Archbishop had, both in respect of the enemy, which is the opposition, the apartheid government, but also in the emerging, over the emerging political leaders who were taking over, including uh, Nelson Mandela. But I must say, uh, Perhaps uh, 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 jokingly also that uh, by the time the Archbishop uh, became the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and uh, he was now being paid the salary of the speaker. He didn't refuse it. <laughs> he didn't consider the great betray. So he... Um, the, 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 I think the moment for arguing about the gravy train was important to give confidence to our people, to create stability at that time, and to compel those in politics 
political office to respond in a manner that shows that we can listen to an ordinary voice of a person who is not in political office with us. The bishop also played a, a tremendous role in mobilizing resources for South Africans who were getting detained without trial and also supporting them in the many, many political trials that took place in our country. I was a beneficiary to the support of the Archbishop Tutu because as the United Democratic Front began to make impact on the apartheid state, it became more and more intolerant and all of us were arrested. Uh, Albertina Sisulu, Dr. Frank Chikani, many, oh, the entire leaders of the United Democratic Front were hauled into jail and uh, we were then uh, subjected to uh, the infamous uh, Delmas treason trial, uh, whose ultimate penalty was death. Uh, of course, we were convicted. The bishop, week after week, traveled to a far-flung town uh, in one of the conservative areas of the Africaners who supported apartheid to support, uh, to demonstrate that the apartheid government was not gonna be able to isolate us from our base. In Johannesburg, in Pretoria, in the south of Johannesburg, the, the Val Triangle. In the end, through the massive support that he mobilized with the South African Council of Churches, we were able to force the regime to return the trial to Pretoria, to be trialed there until it ended. Of course, some of us were convicted as the profile would have indicated. Uh, I was one of those who was sentenced to uh, 10 years. The highest sentence there was 12 years imprisonment, which of course were overturned by um, the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein. The challenge, when we returned and Nelson Mandela was released from jail, was one of reconciling South Africans and preparing them for building a new nation. And the Archbishop's moral authority played a critical role. His compassion uh, he, and his uh, commitment to, to justice uh, saw him becoming the chairman of uh, the Truth and Reconciliation, whose fundamental objective was not to initiate the Nuremberg style trial, uh, but to lay the foundation for reconciliation. Firstly, by ensuring that those who committed excesses against innocent people, uh, who in defense of the apartheid system, could be brought forward to confess their actions, to confess the excesses that they committed, and to apologize to the nation so that the families who had lost their loved ones could find closure in their lives and could forgive them so that we could together begin to build a South Africa, which is not having uh, acts of bloodletting that we had experienced in the days of oppression. And to make sure that the ANC, when it becomes the government, it eschews what it uh, refrains from doing what the apartheid government did. And that is clearly articulated was articulated in the inauguration speech of Nelson Mandela when he said, never and never again uh, shall our country be subjected to kind of violence and injustices that we had seen. So, so the bishop played a critical role and I think therefore the reconciliation that we began building uh, continues on the firm foundations that the Archbishop helped to build hand in hand with Nelson Mandela. Uh, he, 
just to make the last point, because I think you are, you're, you're running out of your time. Uh, I had the privilege also of organizing a symbolic reconciliation meeting when I became the premier of the Northwest province. I brought into that meeting the state attorney who prosecuted us, the prosecutor who prosecuted us, the judge who sentenced me to 10 years. And he said, I sentence you to 10 years because you are an intelligent man. And I believe that you will have a very important role to, uh, to play in the future affairs of our country. We brought all of them together and those that the judge has sent to jail uh, as part of this uh, reconciliatory crusade. We had invited to that meeting Ambassador Andrew Young and a couple of his colleagues uh, from uh, Atlanta, Georgia in the United States. I think what we can say uh, with the passing on of the Archbishop is that uh, the light that was shining bright in our lives has now gone dim. So our lives have become dim uh, in the absence of that light, but it left for us a legacy that we are proud of, a legacy of courage, humility, compassion, uh, determination and commitment to fundamental human rights. Uh, may his soul rest in peace and we trust that his family uh, will accept and celebrate with the world the role that, that the bishop played and appreciate that uh, he has created a legacy never to be forgotten by posterity. Thank you so much there for that very rich background. We really, really appreciate you coming on today. So Shelton Jefferson, uh, so Mr. Jefferson is also a global citizen, was born in the United States where I'm actually here in New York. So he was born in the United States and uh, he now lives in South Africa and he's traveled back and forth to different parts of Africa. Shelton really has a you know, deep knowledge of international politics and political economy. So Shelton, thank you for taking the time to join us on this critical occasion to celebrate and remember Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, please go ahead and, and speak to his legacy. Uh, I think you are mute, Shelton. Can you unmute yourself? There we go. I think I'm not muted now. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. Good enough. Um, I never got to meet um, uh, the Archbishop, uh, but I followed um, his work and his life uh, uh, with great intent. Uh, he was truly a citizen uh, of the world, uh, and he was truly about um, improving humanity for us all. What I would say uh, more than anything else uh, is uh, that I found that he was a person that evolved um, from the truth and reconciliation, well, from his humble beginnings to the Truth and Reconciliation Committee to the things that occurred after Truth and Reconciliation to be able to look back and say, well, these are the things that were good that came out of it. These are the things that uh, we failed at or we could have done better. And uh, so uh, what I would say is that uh, he received uh, for his, he received the Nobel Prize, of course, for the work uh, uh, that he did with truth and, truth and reconciliation and for the work he did to uh, basically move South Africa to a democratic form of government or to be a part of that along with people like Mr. Malefi and uh, uh, Nelson Mandela and so many others. But uh, what he managed to do that is truly impressive uh, was to be able to say what to Nelson Mandela, to say to the ANC, um, truth and reconciliation is not all about forgiveness. It is about reparations. 
We need to see what we can do to make these people whole. Uh, uh, it was not just about trying to, for him, it was not just about uh, uh, people coming, testifying to what they had done and, and basically receiving amnesty uh, for doing just that. Uh, but in terms of uh, people uh, receiving any kind of reparations, et cetera, that never occurred. And that was something that troubled him uh, from what I know until the day uh, uh, he died. Um, and uh, the, the other thing, other thing that uh, was impressive about him was the fact that he uh, was able to criticize uh, his friends, criticize uh, his enemies, anyone that was not in his mind doing the right thing. And he was usually on the right side of history. So uh, uh, that much um, is always to be appreciated. I think it was in 2011, uh, he took uh, issue with some things that uh, were occurring within the ANC. Well, and uh, he spoke out against it. And he, he's been doing so since then. Um, and that is something that he should also be commended for because it helps the party to be better. It helps them to uh, reflect, I think. And, and you need a conscience uh, uh, when you have power. <laughs> uh, and I think he was the conscience of the nation and definitely the conscience of uh, many of the political leaders in South Africa. And with that, I wouldn't say more uh, other than uh, he will be sorely missed. Um, and if he had not existed, uh, then someone would have to have created him <laughs> because uh, uh, the things that he accomplished were absolutely necessary. Thank rest you. in peace. Yeah. I have a follow up question quickly before I go to Gloria and the rest of the guests. So you having, I mean, you, you're privy, you're in a unique position because you were born in the US, you grew up in the US and you go back and forth to South Africa and some other parts of Africa. So what is the general, you know, uh, feeling in South Africa at, at present uh, since it's passing a couple of days ago? Not only that, since you've been going back and forth to South Africa, you lived there for lived in South Africa for, for quite a while now. How would you describe what's transpired? I mean, as quickly as you can. I, I know this requires maybe a lengthy answer that we can't get to today. But since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the findings and the report and the, the, the expectations, whatever that might have been, that um, Archbishop Tutu was, was uh, um, looking to achieve, so to speak, uh, in terms of uh, maybe economic, socioeconomic equity and some other things, justice, absolutely equal rights and human rights. What is your take on coming from, again, both sides of the, you know, of the ocean, the United States and, and South Africa? What is your perspective on, again, what's happening? What's the general feeling in South Africa present after it's passing? And over the years that you've been going back and forth, can you speak to that briefly? That's a very broad question, but what I would say, what I would say is that overall, I think that uh, uh, if you're asking about the mood of the country, it's very solemn uh, uh, because of the loss of um, basically uh, a, one of their greatest uh, um, uh, leaders, um, not just uh, political, but also uh, um, religious. Um, so that would be the, the main thing is there's a somber mood. Uh, I, would, I would have to say that uh, because of the amount of time that uh, he was able to do what he did, the, the amount of time he was able to help build institutions uh, and, and give people hope, uh, I do not uh, see, like when, I do not see a uh, any sense of uh, what would you call it uh, 
there's a sense of loss, but no sense that of, of, of distress of, uh, well, uh, we've lost something that we can't get back. Uh, I think that he's created e enough uh, momentum and there are others to help take his place and follow his lead. None, um, those are huge shoes to fill, but they uh, have to be filled and will be by okay. people like Mr. Malefe. Yeah, thank you. And the generation <laughs> after, after him. <laughs> so I'm gonna go to Gloria, my uh, compatriot here. And Gloria and I go way back as independent journalists and as activists that we follow leaders like iconic leaders such as uh, uh, Archbishop Tutu. So Gloria, what, what, what is the general feeling you're gathering from your network and uh, from your experience following, you know, uh, Archbishop Tutu's history over the years and Nelson Mandela and the rest of them. So what, what is your take on this? It's really interesting because I was a UN correspondent for about five years and I've met Bishop Tutu, Archbishop Tutu twice. And I was looking for this very somber, very erudite, very dignified person. And here was this little guy who was full of fun, who within everything else was always joking, you know, making sure that everybody got his point, but his sense of humor, he delivered it with a sense of humor, but you never ever mistook what he was trying to say. And I used to cover the day of the African child. And one year he was one of the honorary hosts and he came down the aisle with the Muppets and I nearly fell out because I just could not believe, here's this guy, he's got the Nobel Peace Prize. He's definitely a compatriot of the great Nelson Mandela. He has told the, um, the Africaners off in every way, except to use maybe a couple of four letter words, but he let them know what time it was at every turn, but he was still enough concerned about the well being and the development of the children to become part of them and to begin to embrace what they were going through and the trauma and everything. So I love that about him. Um, you could never get, how can I put it? His intensity was masked by his humor, but you knew exactly where this man was coming from at all times. I put in the chat a link to a radio speech that he did at the UN. This is before Mandela was released and he, he pretty much told them where to go and what to get off and what to do. Now, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee that they had, uh, being a diehard ANC supporter myself, and you know New Yorkers were committed to the ANC and the boycott as long as South Africa was under impression. I think all of us who watched from afar the hideous stuff that was going on wanted to lay waste. We really wanted to see our African brothers and sisters get up and kick a few uh, Caucasoid behinds over there in South Africa. And he basically sort of like put that in, in the nutshell of, well, if you do that, then it'll be another 20 years before we'll ever be able to have a situation where our people can live, thrive and grow. We have to come to a point where we're able to play bl place, place blame where it goes make sure that the people who have been victimized get what they deserve and then go forward with building or rebuilding our nation. I did ask him whether or not they were going to stop calling South Africa, South Africa and call it Azania, which is their original name. And he said, well, that was a matter of conjecture that they had not approached. That was my last conversation with him. And I, that might've been in the nineties. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and that was maybe right after the time that Nelson Mandela came to the United States, to New York, for his parade when uh, David Dinkins was the uh, mayor at the time. I was totally impressed. I was impressed with the fact that also he had suffered polio and managed to survive it at a time when other people were dying, that a person of his stature could always see both sides of the line, but he was never fooled by anybody trying to make up to him politically or otherwise. So that was my impression. And I will tell you that if people really, really wanna honor him, they need to start making sure that not only do they carry forward what he was trying to do, but that they also start making sure that they teach their kids because this, this, this brother went through a lot before he even became archbishop. He did not become archbishop right off the bat. Right. He went through a lot to become that and he has carried it forward with dignity, but he's also carried it forward with style. 
you look at anything that he did, you notice that everything in there was his energy, his vibrancy, his dedication, his courage or something that you combining all that into that one tiny little man is something. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gloria. So I, 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 I really wanted to say something to, uh, in terms of what's happening in the U.S. right now with this crit critical race theory issue that's getting us a push back from, from some camp of, of the American communities. Uh, in terms of you just said that we definitely should teach history to our children, which is really, really important. <laughs> But the argument that's happening in the toxic landscape in America presently is that, oh, we don't need to teach that, you know. So we're going to come back to that. Uh, well, well, Bucky, now, you know, no, you just hit my hot button. I come from a family of educators. First <laughs> of all, let's clarify the we, because we as Black people have always had to start our own thing in spite of and because of the overall racist posture this country was started under and continues to be under. So yeah. when you start talking about that, our black universities, most of them, and our black schools, even if they were sitting out there in the backyard or some little one room shack were started by us despite them. Yeah. So my thing is we don't have to beg them to educate us. Our problem is we need to start dealing with the fact that we have the capacity to do it ourselves and start doing it. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna go to Neil. I don't see your last name, RSA. Thank you for joining us. Please continue, I mean, weigh in on this uh, critical uh, topic. Uh, I just have a small anecdote about uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Mm -hmm. It's quite a hilarious one, but it is a real issue. Between 1987 and 1989, I was the Johannesburg correspondent for the BBC African Service, in particular, a show called Focus on Africa. Right. So I worked every day for that. Um, there was a massive Anglican uh, church conference in Johannesburg in 1989. Uh, the American equivalent of the Anglican church is the Episcopalian church. It's the same thing in South Africa. And I had discovered about uh, a week ago that a church in a township outside of Johannesburg had literally been stolen. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, uh, when I covered that uh, uh, Anglican church conference, I interviewed the Archbishop Tutu about the theft of uh, the church and I asked him to explain it. And he said that they, uh, they had decided to refurbish that church in Coronation Bull outside Johannesburg. It was a week long delay. The uh, local community, the people suffering from drug and alcohol addiction, et cetera, literally stole the church. They stole at first the tiles, then they stole the church brick by brick, and then they even dug it down to the foundation and they, so they sold the bricks and tiles to neighbors to raise money for whatever habits uh, they had. I asked Archbishop Tutu at the time, it was an incredible story, how he felt about uh, a church being literally stolen. And he was very compassionate. He was very graceful. He understood the plight of uh, addiction, especially in uh, black uh, townships. And throughout the interview, which focused solely on the theft, the literal theft of that church, he was just forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. That's uh, the the thing I remember about him, an anecdote I remember specifically about him. It was broadcast on BBC Focus on Africa and raised uh, enormous uh, interest. That's all, thank you. Thank you so much. So I have also Joe Umboweni. Would you like to add to this conversation? If so, please unmute yourself. Hi, Bugela, uh, Neil, uh, Comrade Popo and everyone. Uh, I will not say a lot about the acts, but uh, by I want to comment about the host. Uh, at the age of uh, 15, uh, around 1978, I was a naughty boy learning from politicians. One of them is your host. Mm. Uh, I led 
a student march that uh, saw to me being detained. And uh, one of the first people who visited me in prison was the Arch. And he said, let's pray. After praying, he asked the police, the former security branch, he said, can I say something to my son? And he said, what the best that you can do for yourself and for South Africa in particular, for Black Africa, is to request to write your exams in prison. So I completed my teacher's diploma in prison because the arch said, forget about detention, concentrate on your studies. But I realized the Dr. Popo Molefa forgets that through what they established with the arch, Dr. Maltana, most of them are deceased. They established what was then called the Soweto Committee of 10. The photo that you screened now, part of the march was about releasing children. Political kids who were imprisoned. We were young, imprisoned because we could say black power. The only reason we were imprisoned is we uttered the words black power. So they established this committee and fought for our release. So I owe my being and my life to them. At one stage, we were moved around various prisons. Our parents could not even know where we were. We were tortured, hmm. like as if we were terrorists, but we were kids. Uh, it is. It is, it is because of the arch that we always believed that we will survive. At one stage, we were imprisoned at what was called John Foster Square, named after one of the apartheid uh, uh, prime ministers or presidents. Now, John Foster Square was known for its evil. If you were a political prisoner kept at John Foster Square, your family, the next thing they would know was that you committed suicide. So it was an, a, a police station where they kept people. They would kill you and say you committed suicide. Hmm. The arch requested that we be moved to Modabi, a prison uh, closer to Benoni, because he feared that they were going to literally assassinate or massacre us. So, so, so he is not a man who should be celebrated by South Africa or Africa. He's a citizen of the world. Yes. And so is your host and Neil. Yes. I truly owe my being to all of you. Mm. And I thank you. Thank you so much for that, you know, personal anecdote. Really, really much appreciated. But I have a follow-up question for you. So having gone through that history and knowledge, what about the youth in South Africa today? What do you what do you have to say to, to that? Is are they hopeful? Or is there any what do you know anything they're doing to really carry the legacy of um Archbishop Tutu forward and actually build on it? From your prison, what do you how do you how do you see things in South Africa with the youth? Well, I'm I'm no longer youth, I'm just uh, over my 60s now. Uh, <laughs> uh, but 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 the South Africa that uh, Nelson Mandela, Dr. Popo Molefe, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, 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 the ARC, the Arch, uh, Winnie Mandela, uh, Mama Sisulu, and many others, uh, Steve Pico, fought for, uh, has tended to be something else. Hmm. It is different from the South Africa we dreamt about. Right. It is literally going down. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Malefa will tell you that uh, not, not so long ago, I was requested to come out of pension to lead an ANC election machinery like he did nationally. I only was given the province called Northwest where he was premier. Uh, the people did not want to vote for Mandela's party. We had to literally change strategy and go to them and say, 
if the people shall govern, this is your turn. This is your time. Right. Uh, and the ANC won the, in the province. I mean, they started at states of about 18% and literally ended up at 46%. But the, the, the answer is South Africa is going down. We should not be shy. Hmm. But then I have been talking with uh, Dr. Mulefe and many, many other leaders in the past six, seven weeks, to say we can't fold our arms when there is a war, because there's a war declared on us. Our freedom is quietly diminishing. So we, we need to wear our boots and be ready to die in the battlefield. The battlefield would mean fighting whatever is bringing South Africa down. I think the arch, wherever he's resting, he went down a very, very head person, given what is prevailing at present in South Africa. Thank you for being so candid. This is really wonderful. I really appreciate you coming. So I have also, let me see, Kutlo Boweni, would you like to add to the conversation? Please mute. If you're not if you're not speaking, please yourself. Uh, I think I just joined in. Uh, I would I would prefer to listen for now. I prefer to listen, okay. And there's uh, Moipon Masalesa. Would you like to add to the conversation? Uh, yes. Thank you very much uh, for this. Um, <laughs> Yes, um, we would like to add to the conversation. I'm really taken up because uh, what is happening now is a celebration. Right. And I think uh, at 90 years, we really have to celebrate uh, this life well lived. I think from the academic side, I'm, I'm fascinated by discussions that are coming out, uh, like what uh, our a previous um, premier of uh, Northwest indicated the gravy train one, uh, which was not practiced uh, on the second time of reconciliation when he was participating there. Uh, but uh, it's another area where, whereby we, we have to, to, to make our analysis and check what could have gone wrong and what actually uh, propelled him to accept what he never thought was right. But uh, another interesting factor uh, that I mentioned, I think maybe you should understand the context that I come from because uh, I'm not a politician. I'm a businesswoman and also um, a, a, an educationist. So I, I, I'm also not uh, the, the person who has met uh, uh, the Archbishop directly, but I'm a South African who appreciates uh, the people like him. Uh, I'm mentioning all the, the catch words uh, that have been echoed in this discussion. I, I remember when um, we have voted and then uh, he elated and saying, we are free. And with uh, that voice that actually was catching, and even if you can now Google it, you will marvel at listening to that. And he also declared the South Africans uh, that uh, they are a rainbow nation. So those words are catching words that uh, we will never forget, really. And upon the announcement of his death, the most strongest word that was mentioned was that uh, the hero and the moral compass. Right. So you now uh, 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 focus on those words to just understand what type of uh, person he was and really see his strength as somebody who was really fighting uh, for the rights of human beings. The last part that I won't uh, leave this uh, talk without mentioning is that uh, quite interesting that um, uh, yes, he was um, an archbishop, a preacher, and so on. But if you carefully look at what he was doing, he will use a pulpit 
uh, to galvanize the public opinion into understanding the apartheid and also uh, understanding the injustices that were happening to uh, uh, the Black South African and heralded that even internationally to the Commonwealth all over and make everybody understand the injustices that were happening in South Africa. So I, I, I really appreciate the fact that um, our leader in SATEC, which is a new baby uh, born to realize economic emancipation, mm -hmm. has invited us into this uh, diet uh, discussion mm -hmm. so that really we can benefit and really fight for transformation and especially the economic emancipation, because then uh, the life that um, Archbishop uh, wished to see for the Black people, definitely when they are economically emancipated, they will realize that kind of life. So let's celebrate. I marvel at the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. So eloquent. Thank you. So just one quick uh, uh, follow up. So as a woman and a South African, do you feel hopeful for the youth that they are able to build this future to build on what Archbishop uh, Tutu was, you know, legacy is uh, left behind? Yes, I think our youth uh, um, are sort of um, living in a challenged and a challenging environment whereby leadership is at stake. So it means that uh, we really have to, in our, our journey of transformation, uh, we should be very patient and really as parents and adults, take rings to ensure that uh, we create leaders out of the kind of leadership that we are constantly losing. And that the Mboweni spoke about us losing uh, 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 the strength that the ANC had. And I still believe that there is hope. Uh, hope in the fact that uh, the, 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 the system or uh, the strategy that he used uh, to fight for the ANC in the Northwest these are the strategies that we should fight uh, to get our, our youth right in the sense that, uh, number one, they are, I, I, I'm sorry to say that they are a confused youth because they are living in a confused environment whereby leadership is also confused. But uh, those who are still very strong, like myself, Ndadimboweni, and then our previous premier, Ndadipopomulefe, we should really ensure that uh, we don't give up on believing in our youth, but provide training and skills development and start to really show them Ubuntu because as black people, we grew up around Ubuntu and, and, and we should also try to fight issues of drugs, see where they come from, how have they penetrated South Africa, why our youth are attracted to all these funny things. That is the fight we must fight for now and forever. Thank you. Thank you so much. So eloquent, we really appreciate you. Thank you. So uh, Mo Moyo, someone by the name Moyo, uh, would you like to add anything to this conversation before I have, uh, I'd like to read a passage here from the uh, Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission report uh, that sort of like just so encapsulates everything that we've been talking about and we can leave on that note, but I want to see if um, Moyo, would you like to add anything to this conversation? No, it's fine. I'm I'm listening. I'm enjoying myself. Very listening well. to my to my elders, uh, uh, comrade Popo. When I grew up uh, in the northwest, I'm from Brett. I have been uh, watching comrade Popo for a long time. I'm happy to see him. I'm happy to see comrade John Boweni. I'm just enjoying politics and and what they are saying is true. And uh, yeah, I'm enjoying. I'm I'm young. And then I'm learning from them. Okay, great, thank you. You know, I yeah. uh, this has been this has been really wonderful, and and I think that 
the only thing we all have is to be hopeful. Without hope, then there's nothing, right? No matter how bad things are, we have to be hopeful. And that hope really lives in South Africa. That hope was ignited by people like Nelson Mandela, Archbishop Tutu, and many, many people, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and all these people that we're still here today continue to struggle, but we have to be hopeful. Someone already this passage just said, I found a, um, a research report on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's a 520 something pages, but I've extracted, I've extracted some paragraphs from that report. And I'm gonna read uh, a passage from, from, from that report. And I would then have, you know, Honorable Popo Malefe comment on that and anyone else that do have anything to add before we wrap up. So this is the uh, a passage from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. It has been the privilege of this commission to explore a part of that landscape and to represent the truths and the truth that emerged in the process. And we have tried in whatever ways we could to weave into, into this truth about our past, some essential lessons for the future of the people of this country. Because the future too is another country and we can do no more than lay at its feet the small wisdoms we have been able to garner out of our present experience. How profound. Honorable uh, Malefe, would you please pick up from, from here and uh, let's hear your, your, your closing thought. The South Africa belong to these young people to build this future based on the legacy of people like, uh, you know, Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu. Please go ahead, sir. I, I agree with you, uh, Bukola, that uh, that statement you read is absolutely profound. Um, clearly, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as I indicated in my earlier comment, was intended to lay a foundation upon which we could build a South Africa that is united uh, in its diversity, a South Africa where there will be peace, uh, the brutalities of the past would be uh, things that uh, would be forgotten, would become, you know, uh, uh, would, would no longer find a place in that new South Africa. Um, uh, Joe, Joe Mboweni says that uh, the country is going down. Uh, I think in the last 10 years, we have failed the youth of South Africa. You are sitting in a country where it's approximately 64% of young people are unemployed. Um, wow. So amazing. increasingly very little hope uh, for the young people. Uh, the economy is in a bad shape. Um, increasingly, some people in a powerful position uh, do not think that uh, they should focus on preparing programs that will change the lives of our people. Um, I think uh, we need we need to appreciate the dire situation of the young people in our country and to take that experience of our people uh, relying on the work that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission did. In particular, the point that was made by uh, Mr. Jefferson saying that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was not just about um, you know, uh, confessions, uh, that there's an element of reparation as well, which we have failed to do and uh, to, to address. I think we do need, uh, and we have very little time to do so, uh, to address that question of uh, reparation. And one aspect thereof, is the fact that we have many young people who should have had education, but
but they were denied that education and many more still drop out at a high school level. So we need to make sure that we do things that makes our programs attractive to the youth. Uh, find a way in which uh, our youth fund uh, can assist to create more jobs for, for younger people. And of course the leaders uh, would need to master the art of oratory of uh, the archbishop to ensure that we capture the imagination of these young people and school them uh, in the moral values that uh, uh, Nelson Mandela, Archbishop Tutu um, have taught us, um, had embraced and espoused. So it, I think that's all I can say is that we need to work hard to implement certain provisions of the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to the extent that it addresses the challenge of the betterment of the lives of uh, ordinary South, South Africans and understanding that the young people in particular represents the future. Uh, the point that the Truth Commission makes that uh, the future is another country, right. but uh, that future is is our youth. Yes, thank you so much, sir. Really, really appreciate you taking time. Anyone else with a closing thought? Uh, Shelton, are you still there? You, any closing thought for you? Okay. Anyone else that want to? Gloria, are you still there? I'm still here. I was just listening very intently to, to what uh, Brother Malefi was saying, and it's very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. So actually, I don't think I could say anything more after that. I think that's got to be the last word. Right. <laughs> and it was so nice to meet you virtually, sir. Yeah. Very honored. And we will see you in South Africa. Look, you always yeah. bring the best, always bring the best people together. Thank you. We always Absolute pleasure. So just look forward to hosting us because we're coming. <laughs> we always <host> choose. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right, Thank so this you is very busy. much. I hope we can get more of such opportunities in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you everyone for joining us and happy holidays and stay safe. Please stay safe. Thank you. And today and is Nia. This is yeah. the third day of Kwanzaa. Yes. Oh, Perfect. yes, yes, yes. Happy Kwanzaa. Bye. Kwanzaa keeps All right. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.